Hello and welcome to another Tech Distractions video. In this time we're going to take a look at one of the first desktop PCs sold by Acer to 500 plus from 1987. Like many PC and PCXT clones at the time, Acer equipped a 500 plus with a faster processor than the one found in the IBM PC. In this one we've got the sprightly NEC V20 clocked at 8 MHz. This is compared to the Intel 8088 which was only at 4.77 MHz on the IBM PC. The V20 has an interesting story all of its own. It was one of the first drop-in processor upgrades for the PC. It was cheap, fast, and had some neat tricks up its sleeve. It's probably worth a video in itself. Here in Australia, Dick Smith Electronics was the first company to sell the 500 Plus under the Acer moniker. Specs are pretty standard for a PC XT of the time. 256 kilobytes of memory, upgradable to 640K, a switchable color and mono graphics solution, 360K floppy drive, serial parallel IO and a mono screen. During early 1987, Acer was formed out of the existing Multitech Electronics Incorporated, or MEI. The two names coexisted for a while, with Multitech remaining in the OEM channel and Acer in the retail market. While Acer claims its first branded PC was the 915P, I couldn't find any evidence of this being sold in Australia. The 500 Plus was likely the first one to be sold here under the Acer name. Multitech had been around since the late 1970s, and it released its first Z80 based microprefacer in 1981, which came packaged as a book. With a focus on getting people to learn to how to interact with microprocessors, the line continued from the Z80 into the Intel 8088, which by 1985 had practically kickstarted the IBM PC and compatible market. It didn't take long before Multitech ventured into the IBM PC market itself, with the MPF PC and the popular 500 heading for the price competitive lower end of the market. Just three months before it ran an ad for the new 500 Plus from Acer, Dick Smith also ran an ad in Electronics Australia for the PC500, which was sold under the Multitech name, and it was also sold at $995, but unlike the 500 Plus, it did not come with a monitor, and it used the older Intel 8088 at 4.77 MHz, the same as the PC and XT. The 500 Plus ended up being a more competitive deal overall. It was faster, had better upgrade options, and some extra features over the PC500. These specs provided a good value proposition for those who couldn't quite afford an AT286, but wanted something a little bit more powerful than the PCXT. It remained on sale for quite a long time too, with the dual disk drive variant being the long running seller, before finally fading out in around 1992 and being put out to pasture for only $395 with a monitor. Inside, the 500 Plus wasn't XT like at all. It had only two available expansion slots, with the other two being reserved for the CPU and video I.O. cards. For this project I'm using both of the expansion slots. One is taken up by an XT IDE compact flash which is acting as a hard disk. One is taken up by a sound card, a Sound Blaster Pro 2 compatible CMI8330. You'll notice this is a 16-bit card and it's in an 8-bit slot. This wasn't as uncommon as you'd think. A variety of 16-bit cards do run on 8-bit slots just fine. Here's a grab from another video that I did a few years back showing a Sound Blaster 16, Ethernet card, VGA card and multi-IO all running in 8-bit mode despite being 16-bit cards. With this PC I've also upgraded the memory to 640 kilobytes, and I've swapped the mono Acer monitor for an old school CGA color monitor. This one's from Tico and is approximately 13 inches in size. CGA was the de facto standard for color graphics on the IBM PC through the very early 80s, and it survived into the later 80s due to the relative cheapness and widespread popularity on PC, XC and 286 based computers. Most people recognize CGA based games due to the color palettes used, such as this one in Arkanoid 2. I find games that run on CGA to fit in a few categories, those specifically targeting it, and those that simply drop the colors enough from EGA to make the game playable on CGA. Lakers vs Celtics is one of those. It could have really used some palette tweaking in my opinion. Cycles on the other hand uses black as the background color, and it doesn't need so much graphic detail. This one looks a bit more at home on a CGA. Turbo Outrun is a bit of a classic for me. I would play this on the Sega Mega Drive or Genesis, and it hurts my eyes looking at it with this color scheme, but I reckon it still plays alright with the black road. It gives it some definition at least. Moving on to a newer title, Paku Paku. It's a cute little clone of Pac-Man, and it uses a lower, chunkier resolution of 160 by 100 which is actually based on a modified text mode so it can access all 16 colors. As it only uses limited graphic objects, it's really well suited to this layout. And here's one from me, Zywords, released in 2023. 
I specifically targeted CGA while making this game, so everything was designed around the use of four colours, and I used dithering on the background pictures to give an illusion of more colours and detail. In 2025, I released 99 Things, again looking to target CGA and trying to get as much variation on the screen while being restricted to the four colours and the palettes. This one does look slightly better when using EGA or VGA because it will allow a wider selection of the four colour palettes. Both games have got their own dedicated videos if you'd like to check them out in more detail. Thanks to the Sound Blaster Pro emulation of the 8330 and some nifty coding in Modmaster XT by Freddy V, we can play mod music on Little Acer. We do need to drop the quality settings significantly, but simple, old school 4 voice files like this Doom.mod, they're playable and sound pretty decent, especially as I'm capturing this from my camera microphone. Windows 3.0 was released in 1988, and brought with it the familiar interface most of us collectively term Windows 3X. 3.0 is one of the last versions to include real mode. This supported PCs with CGA, 384K of RAM and a hard disk, like this PC. With Windows 3.1, real mode was dropped and standard mode required a 286 based PC with at least one megabyte of memory. The CGA video driver in Windows 3.0 runs at 640x200 in monochrome mode and it manages to look both stretched and cramped at the same time. Lucky the old shell from Windows 2.x is here, MS-DOS Executive. It's fast and easy to navigate, it scales ok on the CGA screen. Windows Write works well enough for the ability to change fonts and styles. Due to its lightweight design, it's less affected by the CGA experience. The same cannot be said for Paintbrush. Due to the 1-bit monochrome palette, you don't get grayscaling. The poor old chess bitmap looks a bit sad here. What about games? Solitaire runs well enough, but it's trickier to play with only black coloured suits. Reversi is good as expected, and doesn't suffer from a lack of colour, but it does suffer from my lack of strategy. For games not included with Windows, we get a bit of a mixed bag. Hype Dream is playable, and the monochrome colour scheme doesn't detract from how fun and challenging this puzzle game is. Hype on the other hand is graphically okay, but the lack of colour, for mine, makes it difficult to play. Waxman Chess Simulation uses simple graphics and the user interface seems to scale ok with CGA. But overall, the limits of CGA in real mode make the most of the Windows experience pretty useless. But hey, it's interesting to see what it looks like, and some stuff does run. The Acer 500 Plus is a good example of what an entry-level IBM PC compatible market looked like around the late 1980s. It was a long-running model that predated the Acer brand itself, and at least in Australia, it seemed to be sold for a very long time. While there are arguably better and cheaper home computer packages, especially for games, you can get a fair bit of use out of the old V20 and CGA combo. The XT286 era was my introduction to computing back in the day, and getting most out of it would be a very interesting, fun, and sometimes a frustrating experience for me. There's a few more examples of these PCs on my channel, so feel free to take a look around. If you've got a content request, something you'd like me to cover, then feel free to drop me an email or a comment down below. Thanks for joining me to look at this little relic of the past. I hope to see you in the next one. Bye for now.